Okay, so according to the schedule, the subject of today's video is an epic space adventure that tells the story of an epic journey from one side of the galaxy to the other. It's got some epic 3D graphics, including some epic 3D space combat, and the length of time that it's spent in development could probably only be described as epic. There's nothing on here telling me what the name of the game is, though. Hello Amiga fans, welcome to the Re-Review, the series where I get to replay and reassess games from my favourite gaming era. I'm Brian, also known as UKGN Zoidberg, and back when I was just 17 years old, I got a job as a writer on magazines such as GamesX and Amiga Action. During this time, my love for all things Amiga just grew and grew, to the point where I now consider it to be my favourite gaming system ever. Every two weeks, I'm going to be taking a look at one of the games that I was fortunate enough to review, tell you a little bit about the history of it and then replay it to find out whether or not my original assessment was accurate. In this episode I'm going to be taking a fresh look at Epic, developed by Digital Image Design and published by Ocean Software in 1992. Flight simulators were big business on 16-bit home computers and there was no name bigger than Rowan Software, makers of Strike Force Harrier. Working at the studio, fresh out of college, was a young Martin Kenwright, producing graphics for games such as Falcon and Flight of the Intruder. In 1989, he founded Digital Image Design, along with his friend Phil Allsop, who came from working on 8-bit budget games for Mastertronic. Setting up in Runcorn, Cheshire, their first game would instantly mark them as a studio to watch. F29 Retaliator was published by Ocean Software and received good reviews from all corners of the gaming press praising it for being more accessible than many similar flight simulators. The relationship with Ocean would continue across multiple releases. Their next game, Robocop 3, is one that I've already covered right here on the re-review. But the game that everybody was waiting for was Epic. By the time it hit shelves in 1992, it had been in development for over three years. And during this time, the expectations of gamers and reviewers alike had risen to levels that, in hindsight, the game probably couldn't match. Whether this was down to DID overselling what the game was, or the gaming press incorrectly assuming what the game was going to be, we'll never know. Of the 16 reviews that I found, it had an average score of 73%. Amiga Power's 34% was particularly controversial, as they even accused other magazines of reviewing unfinished copies of the game. All I know for a fact is that the version that I played was a full, complete version. Their next few games were only released on the PC, including TFX in 1993, the Amiga version of which was completed but never released. This eventually ended up being given away on a cover disc with CU Amiga in 1997. Sequel to Epic, entitled Inferno, was released in 1994 and came bundled with a comic book telling the story of what had happened between games. Following Ocean's buyout by Infograms, Kenwright left DID and formed Evolution Studios, who swiftly became known for their racing games. The World Rally Championship series on PS2 stretched to five games and was nominated for multiple awards. Before he left the company in 2007, he would create and produce the PS3 launch title, Motorstorm. Since 2013, he has been developing software for VR systems, and the Evolution Studios would go on without him, developing the excellent but ill-fated Drive Club for PS4 before being shut down by Sony and then resurrected as Codemasters Cheshire in 2016. With multiple games and studios, as well as a couple of BAFTAs to his name, Kenwright's CV is one that any of the UK's leading software developers would be proud of. Now let's go back and see what I thought of Epic in 1992 by looking at my original review. Epic was a game that I actually reviewed twice the Atari ST version I covered in Games X issue 32, which was the same issue as my reviews for Cisco Heat and WWF WrestleMania. I also reviewed the Amiga version for Amiga Action in issue 35 from August 1992. This was one month before I joined the team fully, moving over from the newly launched GB Action. My review appeared the same month as Amiga Power's infamous one, so their accusations must have been targeted at CU Amiga and The One, whose reviews had appeared six months previously. I awarded it 90%, 
and an Action Accolade Award. I enjoyed the fact that it was essentially the Battlestar Galactica game that I'd always wanted. Even the enemy ships looked exactly like the Vipers from the TV show. Although I thought piloting the ship was great fun due to the well thought out controls, I was disappointed that there was only 9 missions in total. I didn't see this being a problem though, as I would have happily played through them all again, on multiple occasions. After 3 days of solid playing, I had completed Epic, but it is still a game that I will return to simply because of the depth of the gameplay. Is it something that I want to return to after 30 years though? Time for the playtest to find out. So this is Epic. Uh, I'm playing this on the A500 Mini. First thing that strikes you about this game is how much of the game is actually not in the game, if you get what I'm, get what I'm saying. Apart from this intro sequence that we're watching now, the majority of the game's story is actually in the manual that came in, that came inside the box, which is a very thick manual. Um, and not only is the story in there, but also the mission descriptions. So you'll get a lot of, uh, before the missions actually start, you'll get screens telling you, for more information, please read the combat manual. That actually means the manual in the box. Hard to imagine um, any games getting away with that in 2023. But playing this on the Mini um, does actually show off how good the 3D graphics are in this game. Um, if you played this on an A500 original, um, then a lot of the vector graphics in it were quite slow and jerky. I mean, they're still just a detailed. But um, playing it on an A1200 or on the A500 Mini itself, everything is a lot smoother than it was. But basically the story of this is pretty much the same as the story of Battlestar Galactica, where you are fleeing a dying planet and racing across the galaxy to a new safe haven. And so this opening mission basically serves as a, a as a tutorial to, the, to what the controls are. There are a number of control options available. You, can, you, can, you could play it entirely with the mouse. The control option that I prefer, though, is um, a combination of mouse and keyboard, because um, there are a number of keyboard controls that you need. The aim of this opening mission is to just reach 100% on the mine clearance. Doesn't matter which kind of mines you shoot, and then the option, then you just have to simply have to head to the planet. Yes, yeah, so by playing it with a keyboard plugged in, you end up with um, access to a lot more commands. If you press the home key or the help key on your keyboard, it will tell you what direction you should be heading. So two, seven, eight. So yeah, the the opening mission is to destroy that shield. But you need to take out the shield generators first, which are which are these. Phew. Ah, yes, there is a time limit there as well. That, that was getting quite close to close to zero. Yeah, the aim of this mission is to blow up these silos that the enemy is. Uh, getting their resources from. Because there are only nine missions to the game and each one only has two stages. There's not on it it doesn't take you an, an awful long time to uh to finish the game. This is where being able to read the manual and find out what you're actually supposed to be doing on a mission would come in very handy. So fortunately, I did actually buy a copy of this game, um, which you will see, which is sat on the shelf behind me as you're on the other parts of this uh, of this video. 
It's a game that doesn't try to hide where its inspirations come from. Because the, uh, the enemy spaceships are very clearly modelled on the Vipers from uh, from Battlestar Galactica. There's also uh, some, that, some that look incredibly, uh, incredibly similar to, to a Klingon bird of prey. I mean, tell me that's not Battlestar Galactica. While the music does convey the atmosphere pretty well, um, it is quite, it is a bit repetitive, I have to admit. And this is what our Rexon enemy look like, then. So that makes the villains even more hissable, then, doesn't it? The fact that they know they know we're fleeing a supernova, but and we're not actually being hostile, but they're just going to kill us anyway. That's nice. <laughs> Ooh, it's quite tricky knowing which ships which ships are on my side and which aren't. Crikey, there are a lot of enemies. Only 12% complete. can actually press the um, the F keys to change your view. But most of them are not, most of them are not particularly useful. The one most useful one is to be able to see behind your ship to see if anyone is like closing in on you. Whoa! People behind me. Gotcha. That's a few of them. I don't think my overall rating for this mission is going to be particularly good. Yes, this game's still enjoyable if slightly flawed, ultimately. Um, so let's uh, end the playtest here and get on with the final summary. Technology moves so quickly in gaming that reviewing something like Epic in 2023 is a very difficult task. To concentrate on how basic the 3D graphics look by today's standards would do a disservice to all the good stuff that it does elsewhere. The overall presentation, from the music to the artwork between the missions, make it feel just like the space operas that inspired it. The only real downside is that much of the game's story requires you to read the admittedly very thorough manual that came in the box. If you read back many of the reviews from other magazines at the time, it's very clear that both the developer and the publisher didn't do a very good job of communicating what Epic was. Most of the reviews spend all of their time reviewing what the game isn't, rather than what the game is. Which is not a very good way of reviewing a game in my opinion. This game isn't trying to be the next Elite, so why punish it because it isn't? Simple fact of the matter is that I would much rather play this today than the majority of other similar titles, including the Amiga version of Wing Commander. The controls of the Epic Starfighter are very enjoyable to use, especially if you're using a combination of the mouse and keyboard controls, although it can be frustrating that the keyboard controls themselves aren't listed anywhere in the game. Something as simple as a waypoint marker on the screen during missions would have made things far less frustrating. I said in my re-review of Robocop 3 that that game hadn't aged particularly well, and I'm pleased to report that Epic hasn't suffered a similar fate. It's still very enjoyable to play today, and if you play it on the A500 Mini, it's actually much faster and smoother than it ever was. Just remember that you will need that USB keyboard. Compared to other 3D shooters on the Amiga, I'd place Epic at number 8 on the Super League. While it lacks the immediate thrills of something like Guardian or Star Wars, 
it's also far more enjoyable than the likes of Aquaventura or Star Crusader. I'd probably downgrade my original 90% score to 7 out of 10 if I was reviewing it today. It certainly has its flaws, but it's still enjoyable and something that I would recommend you play. Thank you for watching this episode of the Re-Review. If you've enjoyed it and you've missed any of the previous episodes, then you can find them all in a handy playlist right here on our channel. If you stick around to the end of this one, then you'll even get a little musical hint of what's coming up in the next episode. All opinions expressed in this video are entirely mine and not those of the UK Gaming Network team. So if you agree or disagree with anything that I've said, please feel free to let me know in the comments. Make sure you give us a like and subscribe to support what we do on the channel. And please be aware that you can also follow me over on Twitter at UKGN Zoidberg to find out what I'm currently playing and read any insane ramblings about gaming in general. Until next time, happy retro gaming. Bye for now.